So um, I was here at this lunch last year, and I think what's interesting and probably the most important lesson, if I just take a few minutes to give you some background, uh, as I sat here at this lunch watching the heads of state, um, I had had meetings during the summer with Ashish Takar, my partner in Atlas Mara, but we had not yet decided to begin Atlas Mara. Um, in fact, um, we had only had very general conversations about the opportunities that Africa presented, uh, the opportunities that financial services presented, uh, the potential for a kind of a global banker uh, who has African experience such as myself and an African entrepreneur such as Ashish to combine. Uh, but I think what was interesting is that 12 months ago, um, we had absolutely no business plan. Um, beginning in November, um, we made a decision that the single best investment opportunity for Atlas Merchant Capital, which is the firm um, that I started having left Barclays, um, was um, in not just investing in financial services in Africa, but um, looking at it differently, looking at it as um, acquiring, <coughs> investing, running, organic growth, serial acquisition, the opportunity was really one that could combine the beta of the incredible story about the potential of Africa with the alpha of truly being an operator. So we made that decision in November and scratching our heads of how to execute on that, the single biggest issue facing us was what is the right funding model? And clearly if one has uh, the idea of running a bank, building a bank, acquiring a bank, integrating a bank, organic growth and running it, then the traditional funding sources such as private equity just don't fit that model. Uh, private equity has a time frame to it, LPs are gonna eventually want their money back, but it also lends itself best to a more diverse set of passive investments as opposed to what we wanted to do, which is a very, very, very concentrated and integrated series of investments that ended up in a single institution. So it lent itself much more to permanent equity. We had heard of the SPAC market, the Special Purpose Acquisition Corporation, but it had never been used for a financial services company and it had never been used in Africa. Uh, but to put the timing in place, uh, on December 19th, we raised 325 million in equity on the London Stock Exchange, on the big board, in what is called a SPAC. I don't like the name, but that's exactly what we were a special purpose acquisition vehicle with $325 million in the bank, earning one-tenth of 1% 1 <laughs> until we could do something with it. In March, we announced the acquisition of Bank ABC, which I will tell you, if you ever have a chance to do this, don't start with the single most complicated transaction in the world. It was 40 to 45% owned. It was hard to tell by a publicly listed German uh, private equity firm. Um, there was an ownership of the shareholders, but most importantly, it had regulators in six countries across Africa. Our ideal beginning was a multi-country institution, um, but this was a very, very complex transaction given the ownership structure and given the number of countries where regulatory approval was necessary. Uh, soon after that, we announced the uh, acquisition of the Development Bank uh, of Rwanda. Uh, and on those announcements, because we were a SPAC, and again, this is March, our shares froze. And your shares freeze because you're a special purpose vehicle announcing an acquisition. You have to relist with the regulatory authorities in the UK with a new prospectus laying out the banks that you're acquiring. So this was a key. We took the opportunity, since the shares were frozen, to keep them frozen a little bit longer than they probably needed to be so we could supply the prospectus, the new prospectus to the UK LA, but at the same time raise more funds. We raised 300 million more in equity and 200 in a committed debt facility so we could execute on the next phase, which we hope to be Nigeria. Um, but also to close Bank ABC before we reopened. So when we reopened for trading, we would never again be a SPAC, we'd be an operating company. Now, one of the things that was, uh, uh, I think, a tremendous success of this and one of the lessons learned, which I'll review in a second, was that by August, again, the announcement of Bank ABC was March. By August, 
we had regulatory approval to close on bank a b c which meant we had the approval of regulators in six different countries plus the approval to unwind the public listing of the private equity firm in germany and if ever there was a testament to the pro business nature of so many different countries in sub saharan africa it was the speed with which we were able to get regulatory approval going through, of course, a complex and rigorous process. So at the end of August, we reopened for trading as an operating company. Atlas Mara today is a bank, not a SPAC. And we announced soon after that um, uh, the acquisition or the execution of an option with Amcon that will give us close to 30% share in the Union Bank of Nigeria. So that's where we stand today. Our vision is both very, very simple, but very, very bold. We want to create, through multiple acquisitions, through organic growth, through integration, this will sound arrogant as hell to my colleagues because our ambition is to, through that process, build uh, the leading financial institution in sub-Saharan Africa. And you can see part of the challenge sitting right around me here because these guys represent some of the best banks in Africa. But I think having a vision that clear is important and a vision that bold is important. So very quickly, what were the lessons learned over the last year? There are six lessons that I would, I would ask you to think about that we learned during this process. Lesson one, clarity of vision. If you don't know exactly what you want to do, you're not going to know what to do in terms of funding uh, or, in, or in terms of an organization structure. We have a really, really good team in place, and we had to have them in place early and we had to have the funding in place in order to execute on this. Neither the talent would have joined, nor would we have had the right funding structure if we weren't as clear on our vision, which is to create one integrated financial institution in sub-Saharan Africa. It's very, very different than just a passive investment in financial services. Mm -hmm. The second lesson, and this goes against what I read all the time and it drives me crazy, there is plenty of talent in Africa. Talent flows. Once we announced this, we were inundated with people that wanted to join Atlas Mara. Barbara Ayaya, I pick on Barbara, I apologize. She's late 20s, Nigerian, Harvard undergrad, Harvard Business School, great career at JP Morgan in New York. And as soon as we announced this, she saw this as an opportunity to go back to Nigeria and be part of something with vision, where she would work her tail off uh, but the professional rewards of being that challenged in the opportunity she really wanted, which was to be a part of banking in Nigeria, was there. I could go on and on and on. Yurki Kaskello, 30 years at the IFC. He has done every major investment in African banks for the IFC for the last 20 years. Joined immediately because of the opportunity to do these acquisitions. John Vitalo from Barclays, someone I had worked with for 20 years in various positions, the last 10 of which in Africa and the Middle East. Talent flows. The diaspora and people on the continent, I'll tell you, one of the things we don't worry about is talented people. There are so many talented people looking for the right opportunity. We have it backwards. The real thing is to provide the right opportunity for the amount of talent. The third lesson I would tell you is if you can be an operator, be an operator. There is a passive investment opportunity in Africa. It's wonderful. You all know the story or you wouldn't be here. But what Africa needs, so many of the countries, certainly financial services, and these guys will need more than anything, is execution, execution, execution. They need people willing to roll their sleeves up and really run businesses. The fourth lesson, and maybe I'll get booted out for saying it, but it's what I really believe and what I really learned. Sub-Saharan Africa is not simple. It's not one culture. It's not one country. This isn't China. It's 46 countries. But I think that also goes too far. It's emerging as a number of critical trading blocks. To achieve our ambition, we don't have to be all things to all people. We don't have to be in every country. I think even EchoBank would say today, much different than 15 or 20 years ago when they expanded. You don't have to be in every country. The, the East African community is incredible. Um, some of the banks in Kenya and the East African community are so good, they trade at multiples I'll never pay. 
So the opportunity to start by building one or two banks and building the technology in Rwanda or Uganda and build through the East African community is an opportunity. One doesn't have to start uh, in, in a country such as where, where banking has already uh, had the investment and been developed. So while it's 46 countries, it's also very, very important uh, trading blocks uh, are growing. The fifth one is technology. If there's something that all of us can bring, it's technology. You know, we've seen in PESA, which is phenomenal, over 50% of money transactions that happen on mobile phones in the world every day, over 50% come from Kenya. But what we really need is a backbone, regulated financial services business so that we have mobile financing. And it takes banks to invest in that along with telecom countries. But it's also the intelligent layer of technology. If all of us are gonna have banks across border in multiple countries, we have to have single client credit risk exposure at our fingertips. We have to have 24 by seven currency risk at our fingertips so that we can make more effective business decisions. So technology will be our single most important investment. And then lastly, the sixth lesson learned in my point is the heads of state and the regulators are so pro-business that a lot of the myths about this not being pro-business are way ahead of themselves. Um, the ability for us to invest, get regulatory approval, get approval for investing further, doing further acquisitions <coughs> and integrating. If you think about the speed with which we got regulatory approval for Bank ABC, it's because the heads of state recognize the importance of being <coughs> open to investment, open to private enterprise, open to execution. Thank you. Doing business in Africa, you can't afford to be without Africa Investor.